Yeah. How could that be? They are a soul. <laughs> Chris, That comes from Egypt. That was one of the, that was one of their things. Would you agree we're searching for correspondence for each of the terms? But what's interesting is that he settles on the primary image. <clears throat> what is the cave? On page 214. Would you agree with that? <clears throat> because all of these elements, whatever they are, must fit in some way within the idea of the cave. 
<clears throat> but let us now return to the cave and consider its double entrance. The most ancient of mankind then, before temples were raised to divinity, consecrated caves and dens to the gods. Hence the Curites in Crete dedicated a cave to Zeus. In Arcadia, a cave was sacred to the moon, and the Lyceum to Pan, and in the island of Naxos to Bacchus. Worship of Mithras, too, wherever this god was known, was performed in caves. But with respect to this cave of the nymphs in Ithaca, Homer was not alone content with saying that it had two gates. But he adds that one looks to the north and the other, more divine, to the south concerning which he does not mention whether it is uh, previous to the descent of either immortals or uh, mankind, as is the cave with the northern entrance. But he only says, the other of these tends to the south, which is not previous to men, but alone open to immortals. Well, then, it remains, therefore, to investigate whether the secret meaning of those who first instituted this cave, according to the poet's description, or what occult signification Homer himself intended to convey, if it's nothing more than a fiction uh, of, its own, of his own inventing. Since then, the present cave, in an eminent degree, is a symbol and image of the world as Numenius and his familiar Cronius affirm. It is necessary in order to elucidate the reason of the position of the gates to observe that there are two extremities in the heavens, winter solstice, summer solstice. But the summer solstice, right, the summer tropic, which is the uh, solstice so it's circle is in Cancer. And from this point on, we have a whole nice description of the heavens, don't we? Mm -hmm. Well, um, so far would you agree we have a cave that represents to an eminent degree as a symbol of the image of the world? got references to north and south, and so from that he then s continues on this description. At the, somewhat at the bottom of third on 215, he concludes, and indeed the gates of the cave which look to the north are with great propriety said to be providious to the descent of men. But the southern gates are not the avenues of the gods, but of souls ascending to the gods. On this account, the poet uh, does not say it is the passage of the gods, but of immortals, which appellation is also common to our souls, whether in their whole essence or from some particular or most excellent part only. They're denominated uh, immortal. Hmm. So the southern gates are the avenues not the avenues of the gods, but of souls 
ascending to the gods. Huh. Huh. That's because of the sun rises in solstice. What, louder, please? That's the sun rising in the solstitial position. Warm. Yeah. Good. It rests for three days uh -huh. underneath the solstice point mm -hmm. uh, at this particular longitude and latitude. Mm -hmm. And at the third day, the sun starts coming back forth again. Mm -hmm. So this he rises is exactly what that is representation of uh, from the earlier Egyptians. That's great. More. So would you like to take a moment out and go over what you may have? want to contribute in this respect? Well, it, it doesn't cover this. No, no. But I know. on line 22, we should change a word from Sagittarius to Aquarius. But other than that... Uh, yes, let's do it. And can you tell us the significance? Well, they're talking about the night side and the day side or the south and north side of the, uh, of the world itself. So the value of astrology here is basically telling us the, you know, how the heavens wrap around the world. So read the sentence that you want us to change, Arthur. Uh, it's line 22 down starts with the word Capricorn in an inner order. And then after that it says Sagittarius is attributed to Saturn. It should say Aquarius. Is attributed to Saturn. Is attributed to Saturn, right. Because Aquarius, uh, uh, Sag is attributed to Zeus. So we have to go, that has to be Aquarius. <clears throat> yes, you see, we need Arthur's help on the, con one of the conclusions on 216 and the end of this, you see. Um, see, on this account in the middle of 216, on this account, the doors of the Homeric cavern are not dedicated to the east and west, nor to the equatorial signs Aries and Libra, but to the north and south, and particularly to those ports or celestial signs, which are the nearest of all of these quarters of the world. And this because the present cave is sacred to souls and to nymphs, the divinities of waters. But these places are particularly adapted either to souls descending into generation or to such as that are separating from it. See, then he goes back to making comments. Um, the same, con right, another conclusion on 217, about a third down. Hence, because souls enter into generation through the northern gate, they have feigned this wind to be a mortorial, and hence the poet, Varius changed into the form of a horse, mingled itself with the mares, etc. And uh, certainly he goes back to uh, the celestial study on 218. Homer else, elsewhere makes mention of the gates of the sun, signifying by these Cancer and Capricorn. But the sun proceeds as far as these signs when he descends from the north to the south and from hence, etc. In terms of when you use that analogy, in terms of the, the images, the if you substitute that image for what happens you know, to the Christos in the New Testament, and your image of going up and <coughs> down, it's the same. And to my mind, one of the reasons why Christianity you know, takes people mentally is because of the power of that myth that they recognize in an unconscious way as the true path of their soul. 
not you know, a story you know, that's a lie, but the, the, this myth of the solar and uh, soul incarnating and then being crucified on this cross, which, mm -hmm. of course, the solstice and you know, the equinoxes form a cross in which the soul is crucified. Sure. Embodied in material world. Okay. Stone. In the, yeah, in the same way, Arthur, what can, how would you, what would you say about, from your own background in astronomy and astrology, what is he doing? Well, he's, he's picked up a lot of previous myths from, from the Romans and the, uh, especially the Egyptians. Uh, the, the three stars in Orion's belt were extremely important to the Egyptians because of the fact that they were, as we call them, the three wise men in, mm -hmm. in, the, in the later biblical terms. <clears throat> if I may, I'll make this brief. But when we look at the, when no, we look at Orion, no reason to be brief. Okay. But when we look at Orion, we see here that we have three stars that line up like this. Okay. And this is the exact same lineup that the pyramids do in Egypt and Giza. And what this, is, what this is about is that at the solstitial point, at this time of generation, there was another star right here that was extremely important, and this was a star of Sirius. All right? So the star of Sirius would rise at the horizon, and at this horizon would give us a clue as to what was going to happen in the next generation through the next few days. And this simply is this. When you line these three stars up, what will happen is in the next day that they line up, this lines up exactly on the horizon on a particular day, the sun will be right here. And after a three-day sojourn, of Sirius sitting on the descendant point here, or descendant at this point. But after three days, what would happen is that the sun would go beneath this horizon, stay here, and then would start its rise again in the winter, which is the longest night. So now we're going from the longest night, starting to move into daylight, more light, more day. And so this ascension, then, is what represented the whole concept of the Christian Bible of the three wise men who followed a star to see the sun. In this case, they called it that sun. And that was the idea of that story, the allegory of the fact that this was the sun rising. Now, this goes back to Egypt almost 3,000 years uh, before these writings were put together. This, this uh, the idea of Sirius and, and uh, the, these myths were long before the uh, And I'm wondering, when I was reading this, if the Homeric myth may not have somehow borrowed some of the things of that too, uh, which, of course, later Plato would take across and pull across, uh, take from this. So here we're watching this particular circumstance. And when this happens, now we have the sun rising from winter. We go to the longest nights and start moving now to shorter nights and longer days, more light. You have to remember religion started from dark nights where we were fearful of our lives. We could see great in the day, but we couldn't see anything at night, so we had to huddle in fear, hoping we wouldn't get eaten. But in the daytime, we had light. So this is why the whole idea of the God system is related to light, because it's, we can see better. We can see more. We're protected. We can protect ourselves. Yeah. So does this really mark and signify winter sol solstice? Absolutely. That's exactly what this is. This is the winter solstice. This is the, this is the lower point. When we look at the Earth itself, what happens is we have two solstitial points. We have them right here and right here. And this is the equator. Okay. When you watch the sun move from one point to the other, it will rise and make this kind of a symbol on the earth if we followed its path. <coughs> you notice it looks a lot like the yin-yang symbol. But that's what it's from. Or a sine wave. Again. Well, but there you have it. This is 23 degrees, 16, 26 minutes, 23 degrees, 26 minutes. 
And what this represents is this. This is, this is the south right here, and this is the north. The reason why I'm saying it that way is if you stand on the, on the North Pole and look southward, the sun rises to our left. So when you look at an astrology chart, we put the east side over here to the left. So this becomes the east and west points. So you see what we've done, we flipped it. You, you're expecting the north to be ahead of us, and it is, but the way we're looking at it is this way. So we're inverted, so to speak. So what happens is this. When the sun is at its lowest peak, what we have right here, what happens is this is where the souls ascend because now they're coming in into life. They're coming to the long side of life and they're reaching to the side. Once they reach, once they reach this generation within this area here, once we reach our seas of generation as we're reading in the Homer Homeric myth, what we're looking at is that when the soul finally reaches this position, he now has to descend into this particular world. And now he moves away from that. So the soul then melts the flesh away from the southern part. It solidifies it from the northern part. So we keep the complete rotation. Throughout Plato, you'll notice that they use this as a proof that the soul constantly returns. We see it again and again and again in some of the other, some of the other writings. But this is basically what's going on. It's just that it represents the solstice point and how it relates to the earth. Notice that this 23, 26 is exactly the <clears throat> angle of the tilt. So it's closest at the south because when the sun down here is north, we are getting all the cold air because the sun is the furthest away from this particular position. So this then is called the sign of Capricorn or the solstice of Capricorn. And so out of, that, out of this, the sun now is much, we're getting much more cold weather this way because the sun is further away from this point. When summer comes, goes up to this point, now it's closer to the axis, and you see by that position, we have more heat. So now we have more, we have a different position. So now it needs to move down to the cold place. So this is a constant switch between hot and cold, back and forth, in and out. Very simple thing. When we look at the, when we look at the uh, astrology chart, we try to put it in that kind of a, I try to put it in this kind of a situation where uh, we see the soul and what the ascent is the soul and what particular period it might be within, that, within this concept of this whole realm. But this is basically how, uh, how it unfolds as far as the, uh, as the terms go. What, they, what he was talking about later in the text is that we divide the circle into 12 parts. This is called the night side. It's ruled by the moon, and the day side is ruled by the sun. So here you see the ascent to summer, here we see the descent to winter, and this is the this is the process by which uh, they're writing about it, or Homer, the Homeric tale is telling us. Anything else? Okay. Right. So that's a nutshell. Oh, but, uh, from your reading, then, uh, what would you add to what, as Thomas Taylor is quoting all this material? Like, what is he bringing to, to us? Well, what he brought to about me this was allegory. basically this yeah. allegory here of the, of the idea of the soul in revolution coming from the north and south. Oh, yeah. uh, I got that part. The, uh, these things are just a normal situation. I, I, don't, I don't know where, where I could okay. take that okay. astrologically right now. Hmm. Thank you. All right, thank you. Hope that gives you guys something to look at. Yeah, mm. thanks so much. Um, you know, his conclusion is in a page and a half on 220, 221. <clears throat> Just uh, about 10 lines from the bottom of 220. Thus, too, the world is governed by an intellectual nature and a wisdom ever flourishing and vigilant, who also bestows on the conquerors in the athletic race of life the crown of victory as the reward of severe toil and patient perseverance. 
and the mighty builder who supports the universe by his divine energies invigorates miserable and suppliant souls contending for the most glorious of all prizes, the Olympiad of the soul. Here's his conclusion. In this cave, therefore, all external possessions must be deposited here, naked and assuming a suppliant habit, afflicted in body and casting aside everything superfluous. Since two, being, being averse from needless possessions, it is requisite to sit at the foot of the olive and consult with Minerva. By what means we may effectively amputate and destroy that hostile rout of passions which lurk in the secret recesses of the soul. Indeed, it appears to me it was not without foundation that Numius thought the person of Ulysses in the Odyssey represents us a man who, pa who passes in a regular manner over the dark and stormy sea of generation, and thus at length arrives at that region where tempest and seas are unknown and finds a nation. Um, Ulysses, deprived of sight that he might by this means, while sailing over the stormy ocean, be reminded of his sins till he is safely landed in his native country. On this account, too, a seat under the olive is proper to Ulysses. As to one who supplicates divinity and would please his natal daemon with a suppliant branch. For indeed, it will not be lawful for anyone to depart from the sensible life in a regular way, and in the shortest time, who blinds and irritates his material daemon, but who but he who dares to do this will be pursued by the anger of the maritime and material gods, whom it's first requisite to appease by sacrifices, labor, patient endurance. This is his conclusion. Now, uh, in any work, come on, in any work on an allegory, you have to do this always the same thing, right? We'll assume for the moment we have everything we need. And now, all right, from this, we cite the source. And then over here, you look at it and you have to now make a conclusion. The conclusion should pull all of this together. And your conclusion should not have anything in it that has not been identified either as the terms or in, and what they signify. It should pull together into a unity. Right? It should pull together. So let each of these, it should be something like this. See? Right? All of these have to fit. Right? Because this set will now be the meanings. Right? As different from the terms. These are all the meanings. And you have to weave them together. And then from that, that itself is a conclusion but then you can make one or two statements on the basis of the work you have done. So, what we can do, we can take a look now at
and list, let's list them. Change in chalk would be worthwhile. Huh? Let's list his ideas that we just wrote. Huh? How would you read this now? Notice what he's doing on the bottom of 220. In this cave, therefore, Homer, says Homer, in this cave, therefore, says Homer, all external possessions must be deposited here, naked and assuming a suppliant habit, afflicted in body and casting aside everything superfluous. Mm -hmm. Since two being adverse from needless possessions, it's requisite to sit at the foot of the olive and consult with Athena. By what means we may most effectively amputate and destroy the hostile root of passions which lurk in the secret recesses of the soul? Just for a moment. Right, uh, the scene. Uh, symbols that constitute matter. Now, uh, purpose, would you agree? Uh, and he finds a nation. Would you agree we might be able to pull a couple of more things out of that succeeding paragraph? Take a look. Tell me what you think you'd like to separate out, and I'll put it on the board. Uh, all right. Now we have a simple task. It's always simple. We've identified the, the major ideas. This is now the basis for his interpretation. And this is what he concludes. Now we just have to ask, what's the relationship between this and all the things that have been mentioned? <clears throat> right. If there are some things that are not here and not here, what would you, what would you say? Sorry, if there are some, I, I looked away. If there are some things in Thomas Taylor that are not in the, or vice versa? Well, yeah. yeah. Either way? Yeah, like uh, take the first one. What does he say about all of that loot that he gained? Gifts, I shouldn't call it loot, because mm -hmm. it was greater than the loot he received from the fall of Troy. Mm. Right? But all these possessions that were deposited by the uh, uh, Thakians, mm -hmm. right? He's saying that represents external possessions and you must dump them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Correct? Yeah. Correct. But, right, right. but here, 
Then sit at the olive. Yeah, go ahead. But Pierre, isn't he saying that it is not the possessions that the issue is? It's the thought and desire for them that you're trying to dump. Because in the soul, those things don't exist. Yeah, yeah wait a minute. Wait a minute. I want to add that. Uh, we want to make sure, you see, whether he's talking about casting aside everything superfluous. Right? Superfluous to the soul's ascent, yes. Oh, okay. In other words, are you making a comment on what he may mean by what he just said? Correct. Because to okay. me, getting well, hold rid it. of the... Hold it, hold it, hold it. Then you have a way of understanding this, right? Taking the same terms... And that would be yours. That's good. I'm not, I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying just make sure what you're doing. Oh, yeah, because to me... Uh, yeah, you're saying his external possessions is really the desire, desire for them. Right. Yeah. Does he say that or you're... No, no, he no, doesn't no, no. say that. He's it's not okay. clear. I'll just take that and I'll say desire for Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 And you would then have to do it for each of the things, unless you agree with them, and that would be your way of looking at the allegory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, as an example here, um, how important is it for him to make the point that, um, after consulting with Athena or Minerva? by what means, which is the very means we may effectively amputate and destroy the hostile route of passions. That's what he says, right? Mm -hmm. Let me do it again. What does he expect will follow after consulting with Athena? You amputate the passions, you leave them behind. You must effectively amputate and destroy yes. the hostile route of passions, right? That's a consequence of talking with Athena. Agree? Yep. So, so we can now go to that section in the text and see whether there's a basis for making that conclusion when he consults with Athena. So we have to understand from the text what the nature of Athena is. Also. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But right now, can anyone find that nice section in Homer? Then all we have to do is read it and see whether or not we can conclude from that precisely what needs to be said. Let's do it. Would you agree he makes a speech to Athena, and Athena then responds on uh, about uh, 270, line 270, page 239 in my text? What book? What book? What chapter? Well, it's page in this text, 239, chapter 13, line around 270. At this, the gray-eyed goddess Athena smiled and gave him a caress. Her looks being changed now as she seemed a woman, tall, beautiful, and no doubt skillful at weaving splendid things. She answered briskly, Whoever gets around you must be sharp and guileful as a snake. Even a god might bow to you in ways of dissimulation. You, you chameleon, bottomless bag of tricks. Here in your own country, would you not give up your stratagems, arrest or stop spellbinding for an instant? 
You play a part as if you were your, your own tough skin. No more of this, though. Ah, we're two of a kind. We are connivers, both. Of all men now alive, you're the best in plots and storytelling. My own fame is for wisdom among the gods. Deceptions, too. Would even you have guessed that I, Pallas Athena, daughter of Zeus, I that am always with you in times of trial, a shield to you in battle, I who made the Phaeacians befriend you to a man? Would you even guess that's, that was me? Um, And so it, 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 uh, she makes four points. Now I am here again to, con to counsel with you. But first, put away those gifts the Fakians gave you at departure. I planned it so. Then I can tell you of the gall and the wormwood. It is your lot to drink in your own hall. Patience, iron patience you must show. So give it out to neither man nor women that you are back from wandering. Be silent under all injuries, even blows from men. His mind ranging far, Odysseus answered, Can mortal man be sure of you on sight? Even a sage? O oh, mistress of disguises. Once you were fond of me, I'm sure of that, years ago when the Achaeans made war in our generation upon Troy. But after we had sacked the, sh the, the shrines of Priam and put to sea, God scattered the Achaeans. I never saw you after that. No way. Right? Never knew you aboard with me to act as a shield in grievous times. Not till you gave me comfort in the rich hinterland of the Phaeacians. You yourself, my guide into the city. Hear me now in your father's name, for I cannot believe I've come to Ithaca. If some of the land, right, it is some of the land. You made that speech only to mock me and to take me in. Have I come back in truth to my own homeland? Gray eyed Athena answered, Always the same. Detachment. That's why I cannot fail you in your evil fortune. Cool headed, quick, well spoken as you are. Would not another wandering man in joy make haste home to his wife and children? Not you, not yet. Before you hear their story, you will uh, have first, uh, you have proof about your wife. I'll tell you, she uh, still sits where you left her, and her days and nights are so forlorn and lonely weeping. For my part, never had, a, never had I despaired. Um, yeah, she's telling him about sin, isn't she? What, Barbara? Aren't you supposed to agree with me? Uh, I don't think so, no. See, he's making a statement. Mm -hmm. Right, sitting at the foot right there with, mm -hmm. under the olive tree with uh, Athena, and he's consulting with, with her. And how does he conclude it? About what? About passions. Oh, right. It doesn't look like... I was listening carefully, as I think everybody was, for passions or some change that took place in in him, but I couldn't hear it. Yeah. In fact, it says he's going to experience, what was the, the um, gall, yeah. deep gall, and he's going to have to show patience. It's well, we are, we see we're back on the top of uh, 221. It's requisite to sit at the foot of the olive mm -hmm. and consult with Athena. By what means we most effectively amputate and destroy the hostile rout of passions which lurk in the secret recesses of the soul. Is that what she's doing? Mm -hmm. Yes. That's what you just read. She's not amputating them. I mean, I, in what way? 
you guys see it? I couldn't see it there. Well, no, she's not, but she's telling him how to by, you know, keeping his mouth shut and watching. That's not an amputation. Well, but, you know... An amputation? Well, let, let's think about it for a minute. If he expresses those passions... I'm not opposed to the, to, to the appearance level, but that it doesn't say appear to amputate the passion. It says, by what means we may most effectually, right, effectually amputate and destroy the hostile wrath of passion. Yeah, which lurk in the secret recesses of the soul. It doesn't say hide it so you can put on a face for the no, suitors. Yeah. Not teaching him how to amputate, but merely praising him for his detachment. For his ability to be detached and, and telling him to show patience and not. So I don't but what other way can they be amputated? Uh, I would say a way that would remove them from him. But what Just the way other way can a human being? I don't believe that's my my. There's a necessity for me to to give an account of that. It seems to me the necessity is on Thomas Taylor to indicate how that can be done and how it relates to the text that we have. Yeah, yeah, you can talk about his text, but I'm just telling you how I read Athena's advice to Odysseus. Keep I your mouth shut. That, that that's how you read it. I'm, you're, you're, I'm just saying I don't see that, that it's either in the Homer, nor is, it, uh, nor is the connection made to, by Thomas Taylor. That you are making a connection, I guess. Oh no, I'm not arguing that Thomas Taylor is making a connection. I'm telling you from the text of the advice that Athena gives him as to how to conduct himself. But it's not an amputation, right? And, you know, can there be a stronger word than amputate? Amputate is on the, on the no. scale of... of nothing, ling out. nothing lingering after that. Yeah, so let's make it stronger. If you stay with what Thomas Taylor is saying literally. Right. Does it match what's here literally? Like she comes back and does advise him. Look, this is her advice. Look, I'm skipping a paragraph. Now I shall make you see the shape of Ithaca. See, he doesn't see the shape of Ithaca. He doesn't know he's home. She said, now I'll, I'll make you see the shape of Ithaca. Here's the uh, cove the sea lord Porky's owns. There is the olive spreading out her leaves over the inner bay, and there the cavern, dusky, lonely, hallowed by the feet of those immortal girls, the nadiots. Mm -hmm. The wide cave under whose vault you came to honor them with hetacombs. Hey, you know, the, take a look. This is, you came here. This is where you used to honor the Nadiads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here. I'll make you see the shape of Ithaca. Insight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the conclusion is, you know, um, <coughs> O oh, slim, shy Nadia, now the prayer, right? And she, uh, um, then indeed Odysseus' heart stirred with joy. He kissed the earth and lifting his hands, prayed to the nymphs, O oh, slim, shy Nadia, young maids of Zeus, I had not thought to see you again. Oh, listen, smiling to my gentle prayers, and will make offering plentiful as in the old time. Granted, I live. Granted, my son grows tall by favor of great Athena, Zeus's daughter. Gray-eyed goddess Athena, of course, uh, say, courage, buddy, and let the future trouble you no more. 
we go to make a ca cache now in the cave to keep your treasures hid. What does she do? She keeps the treasures hid. What does he say about the treasures? They're going to be what do you have to do? Cast aside. What does she say? She's hiding them for him. No. Oh, is there a difference? Yeah. Yeah, well, in one you might, you're going to return to them, and in the other one, you are not. Look, that looks like a difference. Look, to see, me. two steps. Right. Is he pulling it from this? <coughs> or is this his interpretation? Looks like, looks like his interpretation to me. Oh. I think he pulled it from it. I, that's it. I, I like the way, I like the metaphor. I like the way it's, it's unfolding. Because this, you can take this in so many ways, but we're talking about the soul leaving the body. And when you do that, you have to cut all passions, all associations, everything that you associated with this mortal life. You pass it by, you leave it behind. Sure. But he's saying, she's saying, I hide it for you, which means when you come back, it'll be here waiting. Reincarnation. Mm -hmm. We're talking again, the myth of her in a way. Well, you see, you're, you, that's the issue of there are two ways of going. He, mm -hmm. can, he can, at this point, ascend to the gods, the immortals. He can take the path of immortality. Look, he finished the journey. That's right. Therefore, he has a choice. Which way is he going to go? Out or return with his victory? He's going to return to his victory. Is he leaving passion behind, or is he looking for a good hot time in the old time tonight with his wife? The second. The second. <laughs> hmm. Then he actually, ain't leaving the passions behind. Yeah. Actually Nor does he want to be Unless you want to say it's all higher. See, it's your choice now, you see. Now you can say, okay, now from everything that's going on from this point further, everything is symbolic for the spiritual life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he comes to understand that. Right. That's it, but, see, but that's a way of understanding. But you know what you have to do then? Instead of taking all of the terms for the cave, you put all of the terms in Homer, and then you have to see what assigned meanings you would give to each, and take the rest of Homer's Odyssey mm -hmm. as a allegory. Mm -hmm. That's okay too. So long as you know how you're doing it and, and the procedure you take to doing it. Right, we could say, from now on, he has to face many trials. Physical trials. They're all physical. Right? A, B, C, D. So you know what you do? Specify each of these trials that assign a meaning distinct to each. That must bear some relationship, of course, to it. And then do the same thing over here. You can sit back then and you can write down the, the sum total of all the meanings and you draw your conclusion. That's analogical thinking. Or you can pick and choose out of the work what you think is important, let the rest recede, and say that's the real heart of it, the rest is just cosmetics. That's another way. See, that's not the allegorical way. That's making a judgment about what you think the author is doing in respect to certain key ideas, and that's what you're doing. It doesn't matter which way, it do, really, it doesn't matter what, what you're going to do so long as you know what you're doing and how you're going to do it. Go the, follow the steps of your own design. Uh, see, what's interesting in Homer at this point, though, uh, for Odysseus, Right. There's an intro. Right. This is the 
key moment where now he's back in Ithaca. Right. And now he has to go through all of these difficulties to join his wife, Penelope, and, and, and uh, rule. The first chapter in the Odyssey, the whole thing is known. Zeus knows the whole thing. He says, ah, oh, this is what's going to happen. The whole story is in the first chapter. And the rest, you work out the details. That's interesting. Well, um, by the way, we do not agree that each of the episodes here to get here are distinctly different from these. For it appears that none of these can be taken as literally true. Here, it's all literal. And actual things done, activities, joining, decisive actions, well-designed, plotted. Here, struggles, failures after failure after failure. As a matter of fact, we should turn it around. And then to the Fakians, that's the big turnabout. So, see, it depends upon how you want to look at the work, how you want to design it and proceed. But this work is meant to be an indication, justification for him as saying, the work I have done shows that many places in different places in the Greek world, classical Greek world, or mythology is being used. Uh, Sophocles, all of these thinkers are going back to Homer. <coughs> He's saying, therefore, this work constitutes a particular interesting key ingredient of the history of the restoration of Platonic theology. By the way, uh, then this conclusion is a theological understanding of the Platonic tradition, wouldn't it be? It's restoration mm -hmm. of the Platonic tradition, history of the rest restoration, blah, 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 blah. right? And it certainly is true, isn't that the kinds of ideas that are prevalent? And major ideas in Greek philosophy and Plato? Uh, yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. We'll take it. No. Yeah. Vote. Vote. We'll take I don't it. know that we get amputation of the passions in Plato as a, right? Yeah, well, that is, that's a minor point. Yeah, well. Though it does play a role in some other culture. <laughs> yes. What culture is that again? Thomas Taylor's? <coughs> it's Christian. Christian. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's jump in. So the philosophizes. To learn how to die. Pardon? To philosophize is to learn how to die, according to Socrates. Talk about the Socrates. Theta, the practice. And, and that, that's I, I think that's well said. It. Yes, that is the goal of philosophy. <coughs> Could you apply it here? I, I think you, you just did, or Taylor just did. Oh, that's what Thomas Taylor's doing, showing that it's philosophy of dying? I, I think so. I wish he had said it, but you would say that's what it means. Yeah, I, I, Because I if you cut out all the passions and obliterate them and amputate them and uh, even search out the secret recesses of the soul to stamp them out, that's really separation of the soul from the body is described in what dialogue? Yeah, yeah not in the Phaedo. That's, they don't talk about stamping out and amputating it. That's that yogic practice of drawing right out of every part of the body, but not yeah. out of the body as seat of the passion. If you remember those passages. Yeah. Right? See, in the Phaedo, it's a yoga. It's a specific practice that one has to undergo. That's just, it's called the purification, the separation of soul from the body. 
the shoulder said to be the all throughout the body, therefore you have to bring it together, collect it together into a unity, and then bring it out of the body so that it can remain alone by itself and understand the nature of ultimate reality through that experience of separating the soul from its various parts into a unity so then it can then remain with the intellect and see the nature of reality. That's death. Is that what he's saying and, here? And this is or is this a struggle with the passions? Struggle with the passions. And by the way, one of the most difficult points to make is, is, is to read the text and find out what Plato was saying about the passions. It's so difficult. I, I think it's, I sometimes give up on it. Because it means understanding what he means by courage. And, uh, but Pierre, doesn't the Atima give us a direction? Sure. But, but Diotima isn't saying, uh, stamp out the passions. No, no, I just said... I mean, you're on a different... The, the issue to me is Diotima gives a direction for dealing with them. Without a doubt, you're quite right. Right. But it ain't... No, no, I, I just... Actually, it's... <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, you get the right... <clears throat> Can we say from Lynn, the text so that, that Odysseus's daemon is pardon, Athena? Pardon me, I was Odysseus's daemon is Athena herself. Do that again, please. Odysseus, Ulysses' daemon is Athena herself. Well, I certainly think there's a heck of a lot of good evidence for that. Right, but that's what yeah, I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Except it isn't, it, isn't it a problem of hierarchy? She can't be. I mean, a daemon is this is a spirit, half half divine. So it's the realm between the human That's and the true. divine is the daemon. That's absolutely true. Athena is not of that realm. So she no, can't really but be a daemon. I think would but you she say in the loose sense. she's she functioning acts, like a daemon? <laughs> okay. Yes. That yeah, I think we could go along. Okay. The, yeah. the, yeah. the issue for me, you know, there is just the golden chain, you know, idea. Of being, okay. Everyone has a daemon. In, in the case of this story, you know, whether it is actually Athena herself or one of her minions, we don't know. Well, yes, you do. On one level, you can say you can read the book, and it looks like well, it's yeah, this. yeah. But I'm just saying. Uh, I mean, that's Barbara's like objection is correct that for Athena herself. Yeah, well, that's kind of far-fetched. Yeah, but she is consulting. She's oh, guiding. Yeah, yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. But, but <coughs> to me, if you take the golden chain of being, all those creatures, you know, down the down the tube, you know, to us, are representing her and would be seen as, at least for me, as her. Okay. And one more point, just before I give up here. With the astrology analogy, one of the things that I, that makes it, at least from my point of view, easy to pick daemons that we are have an affinity for is it gives you, you know, a list of them. In a certain character, you at least can kind of look at the chart to see if, you know, if it's a sun, Apollo, or if it's Mercury, you know, Athena or whatever to get an idea, which to me in in ancient times, I think that's what they they would do in the temples is try and give some direction to a person using that analogy in the chart to see it. You know, yeah, see, go along with it, do it, see, see whether you can associate particular gods with this fine diagram and see how it can contribute on two levels, one to yourself, but the other is how does it fit Thomas Taylor's use of these terms in the conclusion? The two separate issues. Yes. Personal meaning and how can you go back to the text and ha anchor it in the text? Okay, I think uh, um, We'll go and we'll finish it next time, okay? Sections three, and uh, that's real fun. 
Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> no big deal, but I just thought that there might be a further distinction that can be made in the sentence that Thomas Taylor references the passion. Mm -hmm. He talks about amputating and destroying the hostile route of passions. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily mean passions in and of themselves that are amputated and destroyed, but the hostile route of the passions. That indicates, to me at least, that what he's talking about is passions out of control. Well, um So what do you do with this then? By I'm on two twenty one, third line, right? After consulting with Athena or Minerva, by what means, see it's by what means, talking with her, it's by what means we may most effectively amputate and destroy the hostile route of passion. Which lurk in the secret reads us of the soul. Does that fit what you're, the point you were just making? It seems to me to be different. If it ended right after the word passions, it would indicate to me that it's passions out of control, and that's, the, that's what needs to be amputated. The out of control aspect of passions. Well, I think you're, well, first of all, I think you're, you're quite right. But, uh, but two things are going on. He's amputating what? The route. And destroying. I think you can amputate the passions and destroy the route. No. I don't think he's required to amputate and destroy the route. No. no. It's, it's a mean, question of how, how you're going to read that right. comma. Right. I really. think, well, and also route. I think that what Raphael was doing was looking at route as being like defeat, like our modern use of that, which gives it the opposite meaning. I think this is the archaic use of route as like a collection. Of passions. I, I, I think you're quite right. But if it did mean like the, our modern use of route as a, as a defeat, then it would be the opposite. Mm -hmm. Good point. Well, next to the word hostile, and so it does describe that class of things, of passions, in a certain way, doesn't it? Yeah, it sounds to me like a hostile the, class of passions. Aspect. But the thing that, if you want to just go one more step, I think he's uh, involved with uh, the Aeneids. Hmm. Uh, not the Aeneids, excuse me. The uh, Aeneids? The Naiad? The Naiad? Good heavens, I forgot the guy's name. Ooh. The Roman. That's the Virgil? Virgil, thank you. God. <laughs> See, he ends by saying in that paragraph that the intention of, of uh, the work through Ulysses is to, at the foundation of a nation, to find finds a nation. <clears throat> right? And that's Virgil, that's not Homer. So, one has to make a jump on how you use the word finds a nation, and if that's what he intended by that reference. It's a, it's a, that if he is right about it, then Homer is doing it in a rather circuitous route away. So. Okay. We can continue, by the way. But, uh, uh, did, you have, did, I, did you have another point? You know, I'll bet you covered it last week when I wasn't here, so I've got to watch this thing. Okay. okay.